everybody. Thank you for joining me here in this parking garage. Sometimes if you need a place for a quiet recording, you go to a parking garage. Scripture reading is John 20 verses 19 through 23. It was still the first day of the week that evening while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So uh, you may have heard about this actor strike, uh, the SAG after actor strike. We have some union actors in our congregation, our talented congregation, who've uh, they've been out at the, the picket lines. I joined um, my daughter uh, one day, one hot day for a brief amount of time uh, out on the picket lines. And so that's what's going on. Uh, one of the things that's going on in the news, I bring it up because uh, if you don't know, I've got a history with acting, with performing, with entertainment. Um, it goes back to middle school, but uh, in college I studied theater. And one of the fun things about um, being a, a theater kid in college is that you got to participate in every aspect of the, the theater. I got to be on stage, but I also got to be backstage. Um, I got to run lights, uh, sound. I got to uh, create music for the one production. Um, I, I, I wrote some, some things for the stage and I directed. So I really just did a little bit of everything and it was fun to kind of, uh, you know, just get, get a, a, gl a glimpse of, of how to do that from, from every perspective. I got to be pretty good at entertainment in college. And then I decided I wanted to give it a shot in real life. I wanted to try to be a professional. And Julie and I, uh, shortly after we were married, we moved from Michigan to Chicago. And Chicago, I did some stuff on stage and a little bit of stuff on camera. Uh, eventually, I got to the point where I was able to join the actors unions because I was working enough that, um, that uh, I was, uh, a member of the stage uh, union, um, which is called Actors' Equity, and uh, also SAG-AFTRA. So I, I, I know entertainment. My wife, Julie, she knows entertainment. She's a screenwriter. She um, is also pretty involved uh, as a, um, a producer um, in, uh, in a, a podcast. Um, uh, she's uh, had experience from the... Uh, talent agency side of things. Uh, we've done just about everything ex except for casting, I think is probably the only thing we haven't done. But so we, got a, we got a good sense together as a, as a couple of what the entertainment industry is like. And um, I know a, a little bit about uh, how to generate um, a sense of energy, create a sense of life using theatricality. Um, you may or may not know this, but uh, usually for a live theater, when there's going to be a reviewer of, of, of any consequence in the audience, if they're not sold out, they will try to paper the house, it's called, paper the house, which is find people that they can and invite them to come see the show for free so that they will have a full audience. Now, why, why would they do something like that? Well, because there's something psychological about walking into a room and seeing the room uh, filled completely um, that that suggests you're off to a great start already. There's a sort of success already. The, 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 the amount of people we plan for have arrived is almost the sort of the, the psychology. And conversely, if you walk into a theater and half of the seats are empty, there's almost this predisposition to thinking that the theater has failed somehow. Well, they are, they have all these seats. Why, why didn't more people come to see the show? Right? So there's something psychological about that. And then obviously, 
uh, the way that uh, shows are designed is to help usually most shows are designed to take the audience on sort of a, an emotional journey to have this emotional experience sometimes to have sort of a, a cathartic profound experience and I, I've been an audience member and certainly have felt that way before like wow I I feel a little bit you know just like a just in some small way just slightly transformed like uh like oh, I'm, a, I'm a little bit different leaving the show than when I came into the space so there's a, there's something really powerful I think about entertainment and um I felt that way about a, a movie a little different um when it comes to recorded things like like movies and television uh there's the experience is slightly different it feels kind of less communal to me but um but still it can be very powerful and can be very uh transformative storytelling in general has that power that that impact on us anyways all that to say there is this trend that has been going on for decades now in which church uh, uh, the temptation is for a lot of people who facilitate church, who, who conduct church, who make church happen. Uh, there's this temptation to make church entertaining. And, and that's completely understandable. Uh, back in the about 1950s, early 1950s, um, this, uh, this thing came along, uh, called televangelism. It, it had sort of these, church-like experiences broadcast on TV. And in order to uh, have a, a sort of TV church experience, you really have to be sharp. You really have to know what you're doing. You've got to get the transitions right. You've got to get the timing right. You have to give good lighting. You have to have good camera people and, and good sound people and all that kind of stuff. So you have to be good at entertainment to do TV church well. And then so sort of snowballed and and um, you had uh, things like the the Billy Graham Crusades that that just attracted tons of of people and and you had um, he was selling out stadiums with with his rallies and meetings. You had um, kind of the rise of mega churches somewhere around the eighties and nineties. And today you have a lot of social media uh, church experiences or 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 social media. Um, pastors and various types of presentations. I mean, this is kind of one right now. It's a, it's a, this is me coming to you on the, the screen. And my hope is that it's engaging, that I don't, um, talk too slowly, that, um, you're not so distracted by the people who are walking in the, the parking garage that you don't pay attention to what I have to say, right? So, so there's something, um, very understandable about how church has uh, adopted this value for, for entertaining. And, uh, and no small part of it is that the idea that uh, if a smaller church, for example, isn't competing in, in entertaining ways, um, that they fear that they're going to lose congregants, that they'll, they'll lose members. They'll, they'll, um, shrink in size as, as many churches have because uh, some other church down the road or, or in town or whatever is putting on a better show. And that is a, that's a, an understandable fear. However, I would argue that all of this is kind of a trap. It's kind of a trap because as we have, uh, made church sort of co comparable to entertainment, to putting on a show, we have, um, helped facilitate an experience by which congregants are consumers and spectators, which isn't really uh, ideal for for what you want for in terms of community. But also, then you're, you're kind of training people to choose to 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 be inclined to choose what is preferable um, in terms of entertainment, the things that have uh, greater entertainment value. So, I mean, you're watching this right now out of, there's a, a kabillion things on YouTube that you could be watching. I'm not, I don't, don't, don't go away. I, I, there's all kinds of things that you could be watching that have to do with, uh, faith and, and church and, and God, theology, et cetera, the Bible. Um, so the options are just 
endless right now. And as those options become endless and as uh, messages and, and church experiences become consumable in a variety of ways, including on the computer, on the phone or whatever, um, then it, it just makes it more and more and more difficult for a smaller church to, to kind of compete, to, to kind of stake their claim and, and say, oh, but our, but our show has, you know, we've got this great organ or, uh, you know, we've got this great preacher. You know, it's, it's hard to compete on that level. So, so church as entertainment, I would argue is kind of a trap, um, in, in just a practical sense. But more significantly, I fear that church as entertainment can be misleading because we run the risk of convincing ourselves that the point of church is to put on a great show. And we miss, uh, we misunderstand, we mistake the, the life of a, a performance, the energy of a performance for the true life of the church. Uh, Andrew Root, um, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, but Andrew Root says something like, uh, the, the life of the church cannot be manufactured. Um, it can only be received as a gift from the triune God. So I think in, in, in a very real way, this passage has to do with that. Now I'm going to walk us through this passage uh, briefly, kind of unpack it a little bit. And, um, and then so, so we'll, we'll ask the question, if the life of the church is not its ability to entertain and engage people um, uh, on that level, then what is the life of the church? So it was still the first day of the week. John is telling us that the first day of the week, that's probably matters for some reason. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, this, by the way, um, at this point, uh, Jesus has been crucified and the, dis the disciples don't know that he has rose from the dead. Um, Mary, uh, the, the two Marys know about this and Jesus has said, hey, go tell the disciples that I'm alive. Um, but they haven't arrived yet. Uh, and uh, or so, so, sorry. So Mary Magdalene left and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them what Jesus said she should say but uh, they didn't believe her. Okay, so then it was, they, they're, the disciples are still kind of hiding from the Jewish authorities, first day of the week. And Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. You wanna give them a sense of peace, alleviate their anxiety. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. He probably showed them the hands and his hands and his, si and his side because they didn't recognize him. Uh, there's something about the resurrected body of Christ that was at first unrecognizable and the same was true for the Marys. After he said this, um, showed them his hands in his side and when the disciples saw the Lord, then they, they saw the Lord, then they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Now I had to, um, I researched that a little bit because it's at first it jumps out on you. It jumps out at you to seem like something that might be kind of like withholding, like Jesus saying, you have this power, this authority to um, grant forgiveness or withhold forgiveness. But I don't think that's what he's saying. And here's what I think he is saying. I think um, he's saying that because of the Holy Spirit, uh, because of um, this, because the disciples are being sent in the manner that Jesus was sent by the Father, that they have this sort of, um, this, this knowledge, this information, and this, um, really sort of this, this power 
this power that's uh, connected to them, that um, if they don't share it, people won't know what Jesus has done, that they've uh, been set free, and that they are invited to participate in this new life with Jesus, and they won't have access to the Holy Spirit. There's something about sort of coming in contact with somebody else and being um, receiving the Holy Spirit by coming in contact with someone who has the Holy Spirit already. Let me back this up a little bit and clarify a little bit. The, the idea that it's the first day of the week, I think is hinting to, to us that a sign of all of this is referring to new creation. Jesus has um, been raised from the dead. He is the first uh, to, to be um, a part of a, a new creation. And the disciples and others like us are invited to join Jesus as new creation people, to have a, a new start in which we're following Jesus, in which God is the one who's in control, the, the, the one who reigns, and um, we're invited to participate in this new life with Christ in which ultimately all things will be restored. All the things that went south will be fixed by God. So, so Jesus says, peace be with you. That's really important. A sense of peace, a sense that there, you know, um, in under the, the reign of sin, there is hardly peace. It's it's the opposite of peace. It's distress. It's anxiety. It's pain. It's confusion. But when you're a part of this new creation, people with Christ, there's peace. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And then he didn't preach to them from afar, but he breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. Now, I'd, I... I don't think, you know, he went, ah, received the Holy Spirit and, and, you know, breathed uh, all over them. And that, I think, but I, I imagine, and of course we can only speculate, but I imagine he was just so close to them. Like, like maybe he, you know, he grabbed them by the shoulders or maybe, um, you know, my, my, uh, daughter Haley will do this cute thing sometimes where she kind of grab me by the face. And, and she'll kind of touch foreheads with me. And with just this nice, cute little uh, close connection. Like, oh, we're, and I could see him kind of getting real close to each disciple and saying, receive the Holy Spirit. So close that his breath is, is you can feel his breath. Uh, so I think, I think that what John is um, talking to, or trying to highlight for us is the the closeness the proximity the the intimacy of someone who is passing on the holy spirit to another person now um even the apostle paul who was converted uh by by his supernatural encounter with christ on the road to damascus he didn't receive the holy spirit until he traveled and in person uh, made contact with Ananias, who basically sort of delivered the Holy Spirit. Ananias had the Holy Spirit, and he uh, he he transferred the Holy Spirit, um, uh, shared the Holy Spirit with Paul in in person and in, in close contact. There's something about that, and and that sense of closeness, that sense of community, and 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 interpersonal uh, connection is really uh, in stark contrast to the big performative church as presentation, church as entertainment experience. Does that make sense? So the life of the church is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit isn't received by uh, going to a, a huge rally, uh, at least biblically, it's, it's, it's not, the Holy Spirit isn't received by, um, you know, going to a mega church or watching a, a, a minister on TV or on video. But the Holy Spirit it moves 
through people in close quarters and close tight knit little communities and moves from person to person. Um, we saw this uh, quite clearly at um, and in the book of Acts and the, the um, account of Pentecost and the Holy Spirit arriving like a flame, uh, um, like um, tongues of fire that descended on each one of the apostles. And then they went out and kind of shared it. It makes me think of, and I'll close with this, makes me think of probably maybe, yeah, I'm just say my favorite thing that we do every year uh, at church is the at the candlelight service um, at the very end. And several years, I've had the privilege of being the person who gets to do the little uh, talking, the little liturgy. And then I take my candle and I get a, um, I light it uh, using, you know, um, I take the flame from the Christ candle to light my candle. And then I pass it on to uh, maybe some, some deacons or maybe some choir members. And, you know, within 60 seconds, 90 seconds or so, the whole sanctuary is filled with candlelight um, because that's how quickly it all kind of spreads, but it spreads person to person, right? The um, one person sharing with another person and, and that's how it spreads. All that to say, I believe the life of the church as Andrew Root says is a gift from the triune God. I believe that gift is the Holy Spirit and the biblical model that we're given is that that Holy Spirit moves um, as sort of an encountered as real people uh, spend time together in community. Um, and that could be a small group. Um, that could be uh, two or three gathered in Jesus name. That's all it takes. Uh, but I think, I think that two or three ideally are having a real meaningful connection where it's sort of a, there, there's, you know, it's like normal human interaction. It's not like going to see a play. It's not like going to see a movie. It's more like going to have a meal with someone. Um, it's more like shaking someone's hands before the service or having a hug after the service. I, I Don't get me wrong. I love a great worship service. I think it's really important. But the life of the church isn't based on how good and how entertaining a, a worship service is. The life of the church is um, granted as a gift to people who are gathered in Jesus' name and who are just trying to, to love each other and help each other on one another's faith journeys. I hope that makes sense. And I'm so grateful that you, you bared with me here in, in this uh, unusual space. And if possible, uh, if you're in a situation where you've not been able to connect with us in person in some way, and you'd like to arrange for that, like you can't do that Sunday morning or something, but you'd like to do that, you'd like to uh, break bread, we could, we could have communion in person. Um, if possible, I'll, I'd come to you. I know Pastor Lincoln would do the same if possible. Pastor Sarah would do the same if possible. But we would uh, we would just love to, if we've not connected in real life, um, person to person, we'd love to be able to do that because something very special uh, potentially happens when two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, in person. Um, um, and uh, I think life, happens. The life of the church happens. So, okay, let's pray. Dear God, we thank you. Um, we thank you for your grace, your generosity. You've given this, this model for us here of, of how to be sent into the world, just as Jesus was sent to us. Um, and yet we also know that, uh, you, you work in mysterious ways and you're so generous and we pray that despite the 
less than ideal circumstances of having a church experience online um, that the Holy Spirit would, would move and shape us and connect us, and give us life to, to breathe life into us just like you breathe life into humanity at creation. Only this is new life, part of a new creation in which Christ is king of a new kingdom and all the things that have gone wrong in the world will be made right. We thank you for that hope that we have. We thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen.